Libraries are still using the same broken data format for data interchange that they've been using for 40 years. Class of 2709 or the marked record. Now this record format was designed for tape interchange of records. The first part of the record is a directory of what's in the record. And the maximum record size is 100,000 bytes. And you can imagine, especially in the Unicode environment, you really can't say much about a work in 100,000 bytes. There's no place to put a lot of information that might be useful to library patrons. Consider Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. If you like that book, part of what you liked about it might be that it's set in New Orleans. Well, it was written by Anne Rice, who was born and lived for many years in New Orleans. So you might want to hunt for other books by authors who have lived in New Orleans. The problem is, nowhere in the record is there any place to put that Anne Rice lived in New Orleans. Ever. So you can't ask that question and expect a reasonable answer of the library catalog. This contributes, I think, in a very large measure, to the relevance problem that libraries face. They struggle for relevance, and some of them are opening maker spaces and other stuff, which is really cool, but that's not solving the problem of a really stinky catalog. So I've got something I'm working on in my spare time because Amazon has figured this out, Spotify has figured this out, and they're doing it better. I'm working on some new tools for slicing and dicing that ISO 2709 record into RDF triples, <coughs> and then having a system that can aggressively, proactively go out and search for additional information on the semantic web and reel that stuff in so that any question becomes askable. Now, I don't know it's still a valid answer. The catalog may not know that yet. But make every question askable and you give back relevance to the library catalog. A proof of concept work is a system I'm working on called Reader Swarm. And it is targeted for people to keep lists of books that they've read and want and own. I'm using Dancer 2. I was wondering where this worked. Here. DBI's class in the back here, and I'm using a little jQuery on the front end. I'm keeping it as simple as I can. And the idea is to prove the concept of this back end data bits. And the hope is that some of the core components can be thrown over the wall in the open source world to turn into a fully integrated library automation system later on. So if you're interested in library bibliographic data, okay, not many of us, or RDF, or you'd like to be a playtester for this application as it develops, see me anywhere at the conference, because uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, library data and libraries are one of my passions, and I'd really love to tell you about what I'm working on. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. Hello. Hi. My name is Bellin. I'm on uh, Sigma Twitter. Minimath is my employer. I'm Bellin everywhere. Um, and a couple weeks ago, I was playing around with some uh, weird function dispatch that I thought I wanted to uh, share with you guys. So uh, here we've got a class that is a little bit well in, uh, a little bit poorly behaved. It has a uh, subtext that uh, is, is a method. It is, uh, Okay, so we've got a class that has a method and it also has a function on it. It's a function because it doesn't take an again. And uh, everyone knows that it would be nice to have a nice internal representation for this class for the class to be able to call bar helper as a method rather than as a function. So something like this would be the natural thing to go and do. Instead of going from and calling bar, bar helper as a function, you're gonna go and say, hey, access it to yourself, and now we just gotta go and read out itself. Bob's around what we're done, right? But the name of this is not how I went through and added self to a whole bunch of things. It's instead how I uh, added some weird function dispatching. So what I clearly did was something on the right-hand side over here. So I invented this idea of uh, another method that we could call, which would then go and call the original method as though it's a function. Uh, so my first thought of what this should look like is just like, hey, we need to be able to find this uh, function that we're looking for. Let's return a class name. And if we try this out by saying, Good little test file. We go and try it out, then we can say foo bar, give me hello world, and we get back hello world. And there's foo, it's hanging out there because our, because funk is just the identity function and it's returning the class name as well. There's got to be some, some method of going and eating that off. So the next thing that I thought is, all right, well, what if we just return some invented class name, which could then go and uh, look up the function that we want and do something miraculous for us, like maybe shifting us class right over here. I've got to stop trying to highlight. 
Um, so if we shift off class in our auto load, and then we go and discover what it is that we're actually trying to do, and then we ask our original class what it is that we would have gone and done, then we can go and do that. And when we go and run it, then, hey, look at that. Foo bar, hello function call, we get hello function call. If we say foo funk bar, hey, hello that thing. All right, so the nice, the nice thing is there is that uh, foo has disappeared from the, uh, from the argument list. So what we've got is uh, kind of a very specialized thing. And of course, what we want to go through and uh, do is make sure that we're not exposing ourselves to the call chain. Uh, we'll go back a little bit. You can see that we're doing a return uh, over here. We say can, we go right over there. And if we say, hey, expose ourselves, let's see what this looks like. Then if we call foo funk stack, then, oh no, we've got this whole auto load thing that's showing up there. Of course, we're going through an auto load, but we might want to erase that fact for, for our users. So the uh, next thing to do is say, hey, look, uh, we've got a safe code right here. So um, instead of going and calling this, uh, calling this subroutine reference uh, directly, we're just going to jump over to it. And by the time we do that, ask for a stack trace, it's gone. OK, so take that call stack. OK, um, so there's some other error cases. So in this top case here, what we have is just some plain old uh, class that uh, we're gonna, has nothing in it, and we're going to call some method on it. Um, and hey, look at that. There's no, no such subroutine. And if we go and do the same thing against our uh, funk dispatcher thing, well, now we're getting all this weird coaching stuff that we didn't expect to have. So we better go and make sure that if we haven't got something that we can go to, then we can go and throw an error that looks like what you would get if you had never tried to do what you're doing in the first place. Um, so do that. Away it goes. This is like the slowest transition when I do that. Okay. Uh, okay. okay, so adding funk to every class is pretty lame. Yeah. Um, and making the dispatch is pretty too. So now what we have to do is we have to go and sting ourselves in and call it a universal funk. And just trust me that that's really going to work. Uh, OK. Uh, I gave this to New York Perlmongers, and they put up with me very nicely. Uh, so what we really want to do now is turn our uh, specialized dispatcher into a pragma. And the big thing that makes a pragma different from a regular module, your module name is all in lowercase. Um, that's about all I can tell. So there's two real big gushes for a uh, for a pragma. Um, in your import and your unimport, you might want to set a little hint for yourself that says whether you like it or not. And then later on, when it's time to go and do some uh, runtime stuff, then you need to examine call or pass any expression um, and looking at the tenth thing, which is your hints hash. And your hints hash here has uh, the same thing that has either been used or ignored. Um, so. Wow, apparently I had a thing that said go and click on that. We're not going to do that. The, uh, the, end, the end result is that you can end up with um, some weird method dispatch um, where you can call functions as methods and erase the whole fact that you've gotten on that. Thanks, man. Hi, I'm John Carr. I'm BrainBuzz on CPAN. Member of Philadelphia Promongers, I'm going to talk to you about a little HTML generation utility I wrote. It's called Form Diva. It is a, another form related module. So, what Form Diva does is it generates the elements for your form. It is HTML5 tag format. Uh, we use a simple data structure and take a, a, either a hash ref or a DBIX class row object for your data. So right now on CPAN, there's like 5,000 modules that have something to do with form. And a casual review suggests most of them have something to do with web forms. So let me show you what Form Diva does, which this is your basic structure of the beginning of Form Diva object. So you're going to give it the label and input class, which are things you're going to need to generate your form. You're going to have this form block where you're going to define all your fields in a very simple shorthand, which is all way a lot shorter than typing out all these form tags by hand. And then there's shortcuts to make typing even faster. So if you use Form Diva a lot, you're just going to save yourself a lot of typing by knowing the defaults and knowing the shortcuts. So 
that line and that line are identical in terms of what gets generated. So, form diva takes a different approach than just about every other form module I've looked at. Form diva generates the elements, the input tag and the label tag. And then you generate, you can generate a blank form, and you can generate from your hash ref of data or DBX class row, and then it returns separately your hidden fields, because usually they just go in a single block. And then you go into your template, and I have examples from both template toolkit and Mojo template here, and most of your, and you let the templating handle any incidental stuff, because I, the other form generators that I looked at, one of the things that really hung up was that they were trying to generate the whole form. And any of the stuff beyond what's actually in the input tag and the label tag, I feel is better left in my templating system and typing out a little bit of actual HTML around it as needed. So you can have a pretty long form and just uh, about two thirds of what you see on screen is the whole form in your template. So I have some more useful methods. Prefill. Sometimes you have some data in a form, like somebody's going through your website and you know from other things that filled out some of the values, but you don't know other values, so you can prefill their form and where you have an undef in a value, it picks the default or placeholder, and FormDiva supports the concept of both defaults and placeholder. Default is a value that's going to be entered into the field, and a placeholder is a suggestion which will go away as soon as somebody starts typing. Uh, data values is useful to debugging, or if you're trying to do something else with what's coming out, because it will return the values that would be used to generate the fields. You can clone a form diva object, so you can create one long complicated form, and then you have several similar forms that are related. You can use the clone method to not have to redefine everything, but just specify the fields you're using in the clone and reorder them, and even switch them between hidden and text type. Supports text areas, radios, check boxes, and selects. Uh, the HTML5 custom types are pretty much supported, um, but to do that, I don't throw an error if you mistype an established form type, field type. And there's all the information, thank you. Didn't know I was presenting this morning, so I don't actually have slides made, but uh, I am here presenting the R Perl Optimizing Compiler for Perl 5. Um, this should make anyone who wants their Perl code to run really fast very happy, and it will probably make everyone else very, very mad. Um, essentially, what I've done is I've uh, spent the last two and a half years figuring out all the things that make Perl 5 run slow. Um, I won't blame St. Larry personally for these things, but I guess he's responsible, in, indirectly, indirectly responsible. Um, so I made this long list, was the first thing I did of all the different aspects um, of things that run super slow, like using special magic operations and stuff like that, and most of it does have to do with like being super dynamic and super magic. So um, then I went and created... Uh, uh, I had already used Ingi's awesome inline CPP years ago to hand compile some Perl 5 code to make it run faster and I was like, well, I'm, I'm a computer scientist, I can figure out how to automate this. So I, I hand compiled some code into two different modes. Um, a mode that uses Perl types, so you can see we actually have SV stuff here. Um, and AVs and, and RVs and all that. 
uh, for those of you that know stuff about the Pro 5 internals. And then I also created another mode that's just using straight up uh, C++ data types. And I had to, I had to create um, a type map, which uh, again is something that's special for uh, inline, uh, or I don't even know, it's something that hooks into inline in the Perl internals and uh, allows you to, to, to map at runtime C++ types to, to Perl types. So then what I did was I created um, a, oh boy, this is squeezed so tight here. A uh, <clears throat> Bacchus nor form grammar for a low magic subset of Perl 5. And this is created using the extended yet another parser parser, which is like your yaks and bisons type things. And so this is what, uh, this, this is what uh, compiling a program or a uh, package or a class looks like in, uh, in grammar form. And you'll notice that I did go and get all of the, the Perl ops and put them in the right um, order for syntax associativity and also uh, grammar precedence. Um, so it is actually a proper Perl, uh, so to speak. And, um, and then uh, essentially uh, I created the input format, uh, which you should recognize this as Perl, um, regular Perl 5, just a uh, little bit of extra stuff there, we have actually data types added in now. So I'm working with Rainy Urban, um, who I know a lot of us love and hate, to uh, make sure that we match up with the data types that uh, he's using with his uh, future and current work. Um, and we're going to have to somehow make these work with uh, the Pro 6 types as well. We can make aliases pretty easily. But you've got like hash refs, integers, uh, integer array refs, rather number array refs, uh, integer number, uh, string, uh, hash ref, and array ref. That's all you should need to write, you know, low magic Perl code. And so essentially, um, I didn't get enough time to really finish what I'm doing, but if you run the rperl command, um, which is pretty similar to the Perl command, and, and runs Perl as part of its uh, execution, you can see it has like uh, several phases to the parser. Um, we also, uh, essentially, you, you, you have to use not only uh, Perl Critic Brutal, but Beyond. So this is like level six of Perl Critic. But if you can pass level six of Perl Critic, then your code can compile into actual C++ code that is directly binary compatible with the Perl 5 core, so you're not breaking excess, and you're not breaking your other high magic code. And what we're talking about here, because I'm, I'm into supercomputing, is essentially a 200x speed up in the faster mode. Uh,
as being eaten away, nothing happens, but secretly, or just in the darkness, something happens. So, this is what I was talking about last year. A nice PBIX class on top of the databases we already have. Makes it more easy, more fun to work on it, more hackathon, uh, more hack fun. Then, of course, we love Venture 2. We're going to use that as a framework to build a new act. To abstract the old data, uh, I created a, no, it's not the data, this is the magic thing in the whole part. This is in the middle. Uh, it knows everything about users, it knows everything about which context it is, which conference you're talking about, and this thing handles all the role the certain assignments that then is going to be able to make sure that you're doing the right thing and make sure that you have the rights to do it, and if you don't have it, then you can't get it. Good. Um, then, abstraction, very hard, needed in this time, because the database is a nice database, we are very careful with it, don't touch it, <laughs> um, but we need to get rid of it. Not from the data, just from structure, because it's corrupted. We need a neat way to expand it. So, uh, then, uh, on top of that, build a nice RESTful API, and then if you have that thing done, then I will say, build your own web applications, or build whatever you want, a command line interface. We love command line interface, don't we? So, something I uh, have to say about uh, REST APIs, there's a uh, resource and interface. We uh, are going to break something. We're going to do something called syndicates and editions, and why? Because I don't like this URL, I like this more. And this makes it possible to do for the people from uh, North America to say, you know what, I want to create a new conference and just do a post on that URL and there it is, a new conference. We don't need many to maintain everything, we can do it now ourselves. So, what have we been working on? Uh, a bunch of resources we could already do. Uh, tap forward, tap forward. Uh, la, la. You do content declarations, you can have nice application JSON or help plus JSON if you like that. Specify it, um, whatever type you want to have, we can do a content negotiation based on languages. And the nice thing I've been working on is putting data, posting data with content language so you can have correct stuff there. Um, then table time. Uh, up to the last second. Many have been working very hard. Just up now, it did fail. We can connect to it, however, I can't get authorization to get into it. So the demo will always say not authorized. Sorry about that, but you can have line exploratory. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Nathan Gray. I'm going to talk a little bit about life, date reformat, and everything. I don't know if it's because we're in a religious capital of the world or because I'm in my middle life now, but I've been thinking a lot about the purpose of life. And Good. So, the purpose of life, what exactly is life? If we have a seed, or a stone, then how can we tell which one is alive? So we add a little bit of water, add a little bit of sunlight, and lo and behold, one starts to grow, and the other one starts to break apart a little bit. We add more time, and one grows a little bit more, and the other one breaks apart a little bit more. So I'm thinking that life has to do with growth and learning. Uh, I was tasked with a project several months ago uh, doing de data reconciliation between several different systems and I was receiving spreadsheets several a day from all of these different sources and it was really frustrating because the data format and all of them was completely different. And these aren't examples of what I actually had. They all had timestamps, and they were nothing standard. Like, you've never seen these date formats before. <laughs> so, 
I felt like this was a rainstorm. But then I was thinking, wait a minute. If a seed grows with the rain, then I need to grow with this. So I started thinking of uh, what could I use to put all of these dates into a standard format. Of course, I looked on CPAN. There are all kinds of date um, modules on CPAN, but none of them handled any of the formats that. Um, well, there were a couple of places that used almost normal dates, and I could use CPAN models for those, but a lot of them then couldn't. I needed something that was completely customizable. So my idea was some type of command line script that I could pass in. Here's the source format, here's the um, target format, and these are the columns that I want to update. Um, inside, there would be a module that you call reformat date. You pass in some date stream. It gives back another date stream. I didn't want it to do any kind of validation. I just want to take the pieces that are there and rearrange them. So I implemented STRP time. Um, a friend of mine works was like, well, could you also add some really cool stuff? Like I know Postgres does really awesome heuristic date parsing. Can you put in something like that? So I grabbed their um, unit tests and stuck them in and built something. It's not pretty under the hood, but it kind of works. Um, also, regexes, both using parameters and using um, named regexes. And then formatting, again, the basic stuff at SGRF time, uh, sprintf. Uh, you can also specify some code wrap, which means if you really want some type of data validation or date validation, you can pass them into um, or generate objects uh, for date time or whatever you want. Um, and then I thought, since Pro6 is gaining a little more momentum now, where it's reaching the end of the beginning or whatever it's doing, and Pro6 is optimized for fun, I thought, let's um, port this to Pro6. So that's very much the same as Pro5. Um, Regex is, of course, a little bit different. I'm implementing grammar so you can pass in not just a regex, but also a grammar. Um, and it's just a work in progress optimized for my fun. It's not the Pro6 version isn't available yet. But it's, it's great fun. Thank you very much. Back, if you didn't get enough of me before, now I'm going to talk about making comments stand out. Uh, this lightning talk was inspired by a blog post by a guy named James Fisher called Your Syntax Highlighter is Wrong. Um, and he had a very interesting quote that really stuck with, uh, stuck with me after I read the blog post, which was, that, which was this. A comment may be used to amplify the importance of something that may otherwise seem inconsequential, uh, which was a quote by uh, Robert Martin. Uh, and they're really the two key parts here are, are this. One, we're trying to amplify the importance of something that might otherwise seem inconsequential. And if you think about this, most syntax, syntax highlighters do get this wrong. Uh, here's an example. This is uh, sort of the default syntax highlighting I had uh, in Vim. The comments, sort of a dark gray. This is an excerpt from Path Tiny. The, the details aren't important. The importance is just to look at how well you can see the comments versus the rest of the code. So what if we pump that up? What if we make them stand out, we amplify it a little bit into magenta? All right, now the comments pop out a little bit more. You can kind of see the weight of the comments relative to the amount of code. Um, and I tried this for a while. I tried this for about a week or so. And then I decided that this wasn't enough, and I went one step more. Now my comments that I use are all bright red. Comments just jump out. Um, and particularly, excess comments stand out. You can start to see from these big blocks of red where there are problems. So if you look uh, back at this slide here with all of the, uh, the blocks of comments, these big blocks on the right, a two-line comment, uh, I realized I could actually clean this up. So what does it look like when you clean it up? So we go back and forth. Lots of heavy red comments. Nice, simple red comments. And I found that when I do this, my comments get smaller, simpler, and they're better written. Um, and so I encourage you to try this out. For better comments, make them stand out.
All right, so this is a talk. The strings are NFG. I'm blatantly stealing this talk from Jonathan Worthington. This was his talk, his slides, and his work, except for the slide that you're seeing there where I said data credit. All right, so the strings are NFG. NFG? What does NFG mean? Everybody knows what NFG means. It means no effing good, right? And when we're talking about strings being no good, we're talking, of course, about Unicode. How many of you have had the distinct joy of dealing with Unicode in your programs? Right. Anybody want to say they're FG? Right. So uh, Unicode is this um, really nice uh, environment that has been created by the Unicode Consortium uh, to basically assign um, code points to all of the different glyphs and characters used in written languages. And there are 0x10FFFF code points available. There's a lot of Fs in there, so that tells you about how good it is. Um, and that includes things for letters, numbers, characters, uh, symbols, marks, diacritics, white space, and the all-important cat face with tears of joy. <laughs> Right? Which is way up there at Unicode code point 1F639. So there are all these different um, planes that are defined on each of the different things. But because this set of over 1 million code points is still not enough to capture all of the written languages that we have, we have these wonderful things where you can take code points and combine them to make new characters. They're called combining characters. So if you get this sequence of three code points and you put them to together, then you get a single character, which in this case is the Latin capital letter D with a dot below and a dot below, above. And that is one character in Unicode. Now, how many languages get this right? All right, so we're going to go through a few languages that are sometimes cited as being able to handle Unicode well and see how they do with these two things. So uh, here this is with C-sharp and .NET. And what we're going to do is we're going to start each of these programs out by putting the cat face to a file, and then asking how many characters there are. So if we do that, then we get a cat face out to our file, hey, that looks good. And if we ask how long is that, how many characters are in that string, uh, C Sharp comes back and says two. Is that correct or wrong? Wrong, right. And then if we do the D with dots, which is those three code points, and we write that out, it writes it out correctly. And if we say how many um, characters are in that particular string, it comes back and says three, wrong. So much for C Sharp. Let's try another one. Oh, uh, you can kind of get things a little bit better. You can normalize the string. And Unicode has some paths for being able to normalize these strings to put them in a form that makes it better. So if we normalize it and then ask how big D with dots is, it comes back with two. Still wrong. All right, let's look at Java. And I'll go through it fairly quickly. So here we have a different syntax, not too bad. So we're going to create the string with the cat face in it. We write it out, that's great. We ask how many characters it is, and it comes back with two, and that's still wrong. Um, then we can try D with dots. We print it out, it's there, and we say how long is it? Three, no. So then we can try normalizing it. Anybody want to write that particular line of code to normalize all of your strings? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and then after you go through normalization, Java gets it wrong. Right? How about Python? Let's do Python 3, because it has better Unicode um, than Python 2 does. All right, so here is cat face there, and we'll write it out to our file. And uh, we'll go and see how long it is, and it comes back and says, one, hey, I got it right. Way to go, Python. Let's try the combining characters. Combining characters, there we go, and put it that way, it prints it out correctly. How many uh, characters is that? It still thinks it's three. Ah, oh, see, Python fail. All right, uh, we can also do normalizing. Normalizing's not too bad there, um, but it comes back with two. So let's try a modern language. <laughs> so in Perl 6, here's how you create the uh, Unicode character cat face. You print it out, that's good. Let's say how many characters is it. Notice we ask characters, not length. Length is a bad thing. We ask characters. And Perl 6 gets it right. <laughs> and then we can do D with dots and do D with dots. We get the correct character. And we can say how many characters is it. And Perl 6 gets that right also. <laughs> No, we did not have to tell Perl 6 to normalize it. It did it by default. All right, so why does this work? Because Perl 6 strings are NFG. And this is a different NFG. It stands for Normal Form Graphene. 
And that's what we have when we deal with, with NFG strings in Perl 6. And the way Perl 6 does it internally is it creates synthetic code points when unit code lacks pre-composed things. So if it has the combining characters with through those three code points, Perl 6 internally creates a synthetic code point. In fact, in WarPM, it's a negative number because none of the negative values are used in Unicode. And then it uses that negative value as the uh, substitute for all the remaining times that that character shows up. So we can store all of our strings fixed width, which means we get constant time access to the string. So all of the string access functions continue to be in linear time instead of being long as they would be with a variable width encoding like UTF-8 and so forth. So, uh, this lightning talk is supposed to go really fast. Every time it blinks, I'm late. Um, so, it's about a new module that I wrote and released yesterday uh, that I got here, and I learned I was doing a lightning talk on it. That was so much fun. Um, it's, of course, early. It's in an early alpha state. I want you guys. You guys just do that. Uh, it relies upon uh, a cool module that a uh, colleague and I, although mostly him, wrote that um, conditionally links. I have to keep going. Uh, conditionally imports things. Uh, and without it, my programs would be much slower because I use all this assertion stuff because I'm completely paranoid. And uh, until I use Larry's module, it was slow, and now it's fast. Um, why am I doing this? Why do we need another assert module? Because I, the ones that were there didn't do what I needed. Um, I wanted a rich set of assertions. Um, I didn't want just, uh, you know, test OK, right? Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. You guys are evil. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to make assertions so easy to use that anybody will use them. Uh, that completely disappear from your program under most circumstances. Um, so it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, so you have them on before production, turn them off for production. But then something goes wrong in production. So you need to have a way to override that and either turn them on or even better yet to uh, make them not be probes but just be carps. Uh, which is that's uh, I like I like things better than just test okay. There's more than one test function, there should be more than one assert function. Uh, and they shouldn't just say assertion failed, they should say, you need more information than that. And you shouldn't have to remember to say if debug in order to make them go away. Um, right, so like the warnings, you can pull in a whole set or pull in some things, or pull in the whole set and then subtract stuff. Uh, each thing should be, each assertion should be very short to uh, implement. In fact, the documentation is longer than the model the code. Um, and we're back to Paleo Pearl, just like my little VT100 display up here. Um, try to, it's, we're trying to use only core modules. Of course, they don't quite do that because I have to use Larry's module, which uses fancy magic from Zephyr, but still. Um, okay, so here's how, what it looks like. I'm not trying to show you how to write a better object system. I'm trying to show you how to write better asserts. So what's wrong with that slide? That wasn't enough time. So um, what's wrong with it is that you didn't test anything. And if you put all the tests in, you can't figure out what the hell is going on. And that takes a long time. So instead, you put in assertions. Well, the assertions, those aren't very good assertions. Those are better. These are even better. Um, and they'll be posture anything at one time. But if you have them on, you get boxed assertions and bailing out stuff, right? Uh, you can have them always running. You can have them running in car mode. And when they're running in car mode, they only complain. And that's about all it is. You can write your own ones. 
that add and subtract just like mornings. And uh, that's all there is. Any questions? <laughs> all right. So, uh, old man's rant on engineers, synthetics, and other stuff. Uh, the very fact that I'm giving this talk makes me old. So. Uh, don't complain there. Um, so, how many of you here consider themselves software engineers? Almost everybody. Cool. So, uh, I consider myself one as well. Uh, although, you know, after this talk, maybe you have doubts just like me. Um, recently, uh, pretty much uh, coming up to the Berlin Hackathon, QA Hackathon, and uh, in some conversation before that, I started looking on Wikipedia and, uh, you know, engineering ethics in general, and um, like often happens with Wikipedia, um, I spent probably three months researching this kind of stuff, uh, and by the way, William Taft looks great in a white t-shirt. But uh, I want to, uh, because I don't want to spend two months researching this stuff, I want to uh, give you some quotes. So uh, this is a quote from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Engineers shall strive to comply with the principles of sustainable development in the performance of their professional duties. Sustainable development, interesting. Uh, the Institute of Civil Engineers, members of the IC should always be aware of their overriding responsibility to the public good. A member's obligation to the client can never override this, and members of the IC should not enter undertakings which compromise this responsibility. Also sounds cool. And uh, the shortest one from the National Society of uh, Professional Engineers, responsibility of engineers, it's a longer sentence, but it starts, responsibility of engineers, the engineer recognizes that the greatest merit is the work. Now, this is uh, in stark contrast with what we see in uh, software in general today, and specifically in open source. Like, uh, some stuff is uh, just downright misguided, in my old opinion, like this. All your code is ephemeral and will one day not even matter. It probably doesn't even matter now. We. Or we can look closer to home, something like um, this is from a discussion on how to redesign, re standardize the tab protocol, the one we use to test pretty much everything in the world. Uh, ideally, I would prefer an implementation that breaks all old implementations to force the consumer to upgrade if some tests are used. And this is even better. If you are upgrading a framework of any kind in a corporate setting, the best is to assume that everything interacting with the framework will break. I don't know. Or even closer to home. Uh, this is a quote from the Mojo uh, IRC channel, this is actually a public law channel, um, in which uh, it says that the maintainer recommends updating in two months increments to get all the deprecation warnings. Which is like, okay, maybe that's what we are looking at right now, I don't know. So. Um, I want to focus more on open source. Uh, here's a great, great quote from um, a portal developer that I know. Uh, it was a comment on some uh, thing, uh, like in, in terms of couple, doesn't matter. But it reads like this. Open source software is a team effort. The software you use for free is not written by a lonely, fat, naked, bearded guy in the basement. <laughs> It is built brick by brick by many hands. Instead of burning electrons to spew unadulterated uh, fear and something and doubt about how everyone owes you something, become part of this awesome pool of minds. It's an exhilarating experience. Try it someday. Uh, we don't really do that much in our, uh, like, our licenses even. Uh, if you think about it, uh, this is the GPL. It says no warranty, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the artistic one, uh, you know, like everything in the world is shorter. It says pretty much the same thing, but uh, in a much shorter way. But these days, uh, we often see that people, uh, software developers, take this too literally to basically mean this. Which, again, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is what we're kind of looking at. Uh, 
So I want to come back to this quote. Uh, this is actually me exactly five years ago. I don't feel this way anymore at all. What happened? I started going to conferences exactly a month before that. I started talking to people. I started seeing what their problems are, what they are running into. And uh, the best way I can illustrate what I realized is to take you to space. Uh, everybody knows what this is, I hope. That's our sun. And uh, this is our sun three years ago, and I'm going to talk about this little blob there on the bottom right. It looks like this. It's kind of amazing, like really amazing. Uh, one of the largest solar storms in, uh, in a very, very long time. But the best part of this is this. Wait for it. There. Okay, so this is something that I always keep in my mind when I think about open source contributors and everybody else using them. So you can apply this to everything. This can be DuckPan, this can be CPAN. This can be CPAN, this can be the toolchain gang. Uh, this can be the toolchain gang, this can be the single developer. It always works and it always exactly shows you the actual relationship to things. And uh, what does this all mean? Like, how do we bring these things together? I don't know. If I knew I wouldn't be standing here, I would be solving the problem that we have uh, of this um, friction in, in the software world, in the open source world, and so on and so forth. But uh, what uh, I realized uh, when I went to Berlin is that people do not really make their wishes hurt for the most time uh, when people just want their stuff to work without anything else. So what can you do? I think you can make yourself hurt. And the easiest way to do this is if you use a CPI module and anything is wrong with it, like anything that you don't like, like it doesn't install, it uh, breaks in a weird way, or it stopped working on your version for you, just send an email to this. It's that simple. It doesn't require any time investment. Just shoot an email, hey, this used to work, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't have to be a patch, it just has to be a report of a problem. For example, all those are actual valid email addresses. And maybe in a year when more people actually speak up that, you know, we're breaking way too much stuff, maybe I will stand here and I will be giving a much, much, much stronger talk and, you know, hopefully this is it. And I'm out of time. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more, those are excellent talks and articles. And thank you. So our last speaker is coming up now. I'll just make a few closing announcements as he gets set up. If you have a lightning talk for the future days, please find me and submit it through the conference website. If, and one last thing, if you have decided where you're going for lunch, and it is walkable, when he finishes his talk, come up here, say where you're going, and where around this room or just outside you will be standing to gather more people and take them with you. Thank you.
Pearl is mighty fine. Pearl can say okay. Pearl is mighty fine. Oh, you good? Pearl is mighty fine. Pearl is a-okay. 